Good evening. Thank you for your coming. My name is Mehdi Azeiz. Um, I'm a postdoctoral fellow in Islamic studies at the University of Notre Dame. I'm the co-director, along with Professor Gabriel Said Reynolds, of the Quran Seminar, a project going, uh, going on throughout this academic year de dedicated to advancing our scholarly understanding of the Quranic text. One goal of this project is to propose a series of public lectures by leading Muslims intellectuals. Tonight and tomorrow, I will have the pleasure and the honor to introduce two prominent Muslim intellectual women. Our guest tonight will be Naila Tabara, and our second guest tomorrow will be Miriam Musharraf. I said, my dear friend, the Professor Gabriel Said Reynolds, we hope that together these lectures, those lectures will showcase the diverse and dynamic currents of contemporary thought in Islamic world today. So it's my pleasure tonight to introduce our first exceptional guest, Naila Tabara. Naila Tabara was born in Lebanon, where she lives, Lebanon, sorry. She's the director of the Cross-Cultural Studies Department in the Adyen Foundation, she co-founded in 2008. The Cross-Cultural Studies Department works at the local, regional, and international levels and aims to promote cross-cultural teaching and learning about cultural and religious diversity, helping young generation to think, communicate, and act in a multi multicultural global world. In addition to her, uh, to her responsibility as director of the Cross-Cultural Studies Department, she's a distinguished professor of religion of history in different well-known institutions and universities in Beirut, like uh, St. Joseph University. Naila Tabara has been an active researcher in different international institutions for the UNESCO Chair of Comparative Study of Religions, Mediations, and Dialogue between 2008 and 2011, but also in the International Federation of Catholic Universities between 2007 and 2011. She was also a member and researcher at a French association called Groupe de Recherche Islamo-Chrétien, Greek, between 2005 and 2010. Naila is a well-known expert on Quranic exeges, exeges and mysticism, Sufis. In fact, she holds a PhD from Sorbonne, Paris, Paris, and University of Saint Joseph uh, in 2007. In her dissertation, written in, in French, titled Les commentaires Sufis de la Sourate de la Caverne, le récit coranique comme symbole de l'itinéraire spirituel, the Sufi commentaries of Surat al kahf Quranic narrative as symbol of spiritual itinerary. She studied 15 different uh, Quranic commentaries, of which nine mysticis, uh, mystical commentaries, sorry, of the Surat al uh, one chapter, 18th century, uh, chapter of the Quran, 18. In addition to her knowledge and expertise in the Quran and Islamic religious studies, she's also an expert on interfaith dialogue, Muslim feminism, and world religions. Her, pub her publications are impressive by the numerous monographs and articles in French, Arabic, and English, focusing mainly on the historical development of Muslim Christians' relations, and also by her engagement for inter interreligious and intercultural dialogue and peace building. Among those work, I would like to cut uh, what about the other, a question for intercultural education in the 20, 21 century. She's an editor of the book. Um, uh, the second book is Divin, uh, Divin Hospitality, Christians and Muslims Theology on the, uh, of the Other, sorry, in Arabic. Um, and forth, forthcoming, uh, a version of her thesis uh, of her dissertation, the spiritual itinerary, itinerary in Sufi interpretation of the Quran in French. Uh, she wrote also different articles that underline her outstanding knowledge of Islamic religion and 
Education for Peace, among them, and more recently, uh, an article uh, titled Education on Religious Div Diversity in Arabic and Recommendations for Euro-Arab Cross-Cultural Education, uh, both in this year, were published this year. She will too naturally share uh, with, her, uh, with us her expertise in Quran and interfaith dialogue, but before we have the chance to before the, we have the chance to listen to her, I just want you to remind that uh, tomorrow the second lecture will take place at the room 100, uh, 104 of McKenna Hall. I would like to have that our dear guest. Ah, sorry. Um, tomorrow it will be Dr. Miriam Musharraf uh, that, would, that will speak. Um, I would like to add that our dear guest will speak 40 or 45 minutes, and we will have the possibility, you will have the possibility to ask questions during 15 or 20 minutes. So tonight we have the pleasure to listen to uh, Naila Tabara for a lecture titled The Quran and Muslim Christians' Relation. I'm sure you all join me in welcoming Professor Naila Tabara. Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you, Mehdi, for this uh, this introduction. Uh, but this this introduction about me promises that my presentation should be, I mean, phenomenal. So I will blame the fact that it's not on jet lag. <laughs> okay. um, I'm very happy. I'm very pleased to be with you today. I thank uh, Dr. Gabriel Reynolds for inviting me here. And I'm very glad to be seeing many faces that I uh, know already and to meet new faces. Uh, two things before I start my presentation, thank you. Um, I tried in to, to put in it, in 30 minutes, uh, uh, the, uh, I'm translating an expression from Arabic, the juice of my thought, <laughs> so me, <laughs> the, the, the maximum. So I hope you will bear with me. Two, uh, I tend to sometimes say thing in, things in a shocking way. So also I hope that you will bear with me on that. So why uh, is my presentation entitled The Quran and Muslim-Christian Relations? First, because Muslim-Christian relations are founded from the uh, Muslim side on the Islamic perception of Christianity and uh, Christians, and that perception is based on the Quranic text mainly. The rest from tradition, of course, but mainly from the Quranic text. Uh, what in the Quranic text? The Quranic text has, uh, as many of you know, uh, a, a large number of verses, some speaking about Christianity, some speaking about Christians, uh, some speaking about the shared, uh, uh, mainly stories uh, of, uh, of prophets and figures, uh, so mainly biblical figures. Uh, the talks also more in more general terms about the people of the book, generally referring to Christians and Jews, and also has verses uh, concerning religious diversity. So we will tap into those. The challenges that uh, we need to face when we are working with the Quran is that many times we have apparent contradictions between the verses. This is why you could hear different Islamic discourses concerning the other or concerning other topics. Because, uh, many, because some verses would uh, go into a certain direction and other would, others would go into a completely different direction. Some people would choose to take one direction only and uh, the others would try to take also the other direction. What I'm trying to do here is to get both together and try to understand them together. So we have this contradiction or apparent contradiction between verses on the theological level and on the practical level. This leads to diverging perception of the other and opposing behavioral patterns towards the other because they are linked. If I perceive the other as, uh, uh, as an uh, infidel, as uh, somebody who is a, a danger for me, that my, my, uh, my way, my behavior will, will, with the other will be 
uh, based on this uh, belief. If I believe, on the contrary, that the other is a part of a, uh, a line of revelation that I belong to, and that we are carrying the same values, and that together we we are uh, we are responsible of uh, of our societies, then I would believe I would behave with, uh, differently based on those values with, with the other. So. Uh, a second thing that we need to uh, take into consideration is that we have a challenge based on the context. We have two different con contexts to take into account. Uh, the context of the revelation itself, and I will come back to that, and the context of the interpretation. The context of the revelation is that the Quranic text was revealed for a period of 23 years. And uh, it, this revelation is always in dialogue with the context itself, with what is happening with the first Muslims, with the, first, uh, situa with the situation and the changing situation. So, uh, of course, verses will uh, be different from one context to the other within those 23 years. The second context that is important is the context of interpretation. The, our main sources of interpretation have been made mainly as of the third century uh, of uh, Hijri, and, uh, which is the ninth century. So our main sources date back to that time, and that was a context of uh, post-conquests uh, and a certain political situation where, political and social situation where Islam was the, uh, the uh, I mean, ruling, uh, uh, was governing, and uh, dealing with the other, as a uh, as a empires, I mean, with uh, people governed, and let's not forget also the financial aspect of uh, having the others as part of your uh, empire. So I will start with. So I will divide this presentation into two parts: the theological and then the uh, behavioral. So the theological contradictions. This. My, my, my uh, subtitle here is the need for holistic interpretation. This is what I was talking about. We need to gather the uh, texts together. I will start with one contradiction. We know, we hear a lot of people talking about that the Quran makes it easy for us because it talks about the principle of diversity. It repeats many a times that diversity is, uh, is willed by God, that God wanted diversity. So here you have two examples. Al-Baqarah uh, 148, to each is a direction towards which, towards which to turn, meaning to each is a way of a practice, a way of faith, a direction here meaning a way of, uh, of practice. Uh, and the, the second one, uh, for each we have appointed a divine law and a traced out way. So each also, I mean for each here, for each of the communities. So the Quran is already talking making it easier and saying that God wanted diversity. Uh, other verses would say that, uh, I mean, if he wanted, he would have created you, made you all as, uh, as one. But he willed this diversity. And then uh, you have verses that are talking about the different religions. So uh, those who believe and those who follow Judaism and the Christians and the Sabaeans, those who believe in God uh, and the last day and work uh, righteousness shall have their uh, reward with their Lord. Uh, on them shall be no fear, nor uh, shall they grieve. This is, of course, a, a, a promise of salvation for uh, the followers of the religions mentioned here and all those who believe and uh, do good deeds. Yet, we have this last verse that I have here that is saying religion before God is Islam. So how do we resolve it? How do we resolve both? Because as I told you, some people would take only that part and the, other, the others would take only the first ones. So there are two, three solutions to this uh, question. The uh, medieval solution, the most easy one, was to take the last verse that I mentioned, religion for God is Islam, and to say that it abrogated, meaning it erased the meaning of all the other verses. So some say that uh, for those uh, uh, scholars, one verse abrogated a minimum of 50 other verses. 
erased a minimum of 50 other verses. So that was the easy way out, and the easy but, I mean, uh, closed, let's say, uh, way, out, way out, or exclusivist way out. A second way out that we find more and more these days, that is more common today, I mean, as of the, in the 20th century, it was more and more common, is that to see that there are two meanings for the word Islam. Islam in Arabic means submission to God. So some say that the verse religion for God is Islam means that religion for God is submission to God, meaning Islam in the larger sense, uh, returning to the idea of that it's one, uh, it's a continuous revelation. So Judaism, Christianity, and other Abrahamic religions are all into one, uh, uh, one revelation, and uh, religion for God would be Islam in this large sense which is different from Islam in the restricted sense as the religion of Islam today. This is the most widespread uh, today. A third one would be, according to me, the most legitimate one, is to say that Islam accepts other religions, as we saw in the, other, in the verse, uh, mainly uh, the, the religion it mentions in the Quran, uh, and accepts them as uh, leading to salvation, yet sees itself and its legitimate as the best way. Each religion has the right to accept others, yet always promote that it's the best. Okay, so this is the third, uh, uh, the third. but I, I go back and say that the second one is the one that is most widespread. So, uh, so on the theological level, basically, it is the context of interpretation that has varied, not the context of revelation. So for the medieval times, we had the interpretation going uh, more towards the abrogation, taking the verse religion for God is Islam and saying that it's abrogating the others. Uh, recently, at least a century ago, we have more and more uh, people going for the second one, saying that here it's Islam in the larger sense, and anybody who believes in God is considered as being uh, in Islam in the larger uh, uh, sense. Uh, and keeping in mind that in the theological, on this theological level, the Quran has constants. It is always reminding that there are commonalities, that, uh, that are so many... Uh, such a big space for shared uh, values, shared history, uh, shared heritage between Islam, Christianity, and Judaism, mainly. And pointing out the divergences, what are the dogmatic differences? Quran, the Quran points it out in, in a nutshell. So there is, the, as, 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 a, uh, as a belief system, the belief in one God, the belief in, in, in Revelation, the belief in the previous books, the belief in the prophets, in Mary, in the, in the uh, I mean, the miraculous birth of Jesus, all of that is common. The divergence being not uh, believe, the divergence with Christianity being not uh, believing in uh, Trinity or incarnation, and the divergence with uh, Judaism uh, being believing that Jesus is the Messiah. So those are the, the those are the, point, the 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 divergences that the Quran points out on the theological level. Yet it also talks about the all the commonalities, as we will see. And the third thing is the promise of salvation. We can see the promise of salvation in what I call the bracket example. Um, the, you know that the uh, as uh, mentioned before, the uh, first phase of revelation of the Quran. Uh, the, uh, excuse me, the, the, the time of the revelation of the Quran is divided into two phases, the Meccan phase, the beginning, and then the Medinan phase, the last 10 years. The Medina phase uh, starts with Surat Al-Baqarah and ends, according to many, with Surat Al-Ma'idah. So we, would, we find the same verse repeated in both. And that verse is talking about salvation for uh, Christians, Sabaeans, and uh, those who follow Judaism, for Jews, and for any who believe in God and uh, the last day, I mean the uh, 
Judgment Day and human responsibility uh, in front of God. So this bracket example is like a uh, uh, asserting that salvation is promised for others. It's asserting the recognition of the other religions as path towards God and towards salvation. Okay. Uh, and in a nutshell, the Quran's theological position is that salvation does not depend on the identity. It is not your desires nor those of the people of the book. Whoever works evil will be requited accordingly, and whoever does good will also be uh, rewarded, I mean accordingly. And ending here also with the best religion is submitting to God, the way of Abraham. The Quran always remi reminds of the way of Abraham. So with this, I close the theological part. The practical part, which is more, uh, even more problematic. Why? With the practical part, we have really uh, also contradictions. We have positive verses and we have negative verses. The positive verses, like this one, uh, calling that saying that God has created you male and female and made you nations and tribes that you may know each other. So it's a call to go and meet. And uh, tribes here means uh, communities, religious communities. The second one is that uh, all people of the book come to common terms between us, that we worship none but God, we all worship one God. And many others like that, many other positive verses uh, verses, as we will see, that are calling others believers, the same, the, using the same term that uh, the Quran uses for Islamic, uh, for Muslim believers. So, or uh, doing a uh, eulogy, eloge, for uh, for Christians, for uh, uh, priests, their humility, and uh, and many verses like that. But yet, we have negative verses. Negative versus on the uh, level of, uh, uh, of, of behavior. So this, the first one is saying quite a number of the people of the book wish they could turn you back to infidelity after you have believed. So it is calling for a sort of not trusting the other. The second one is, I mean, this is the verse called the verse of the sword. It's fight. Fight those of the people of the book who believe not in God nor the last day. Okay, so it's a call for fighting. And uh, the, the third one is also ta saying, again, do not trust and do not take them for allies. So we have the positive and the negative. Here, we have to go back to the context. So I will remind you, between 609 and uh, 622, the first phase of revelation in Mecca. Okay? This first phase of revelation in Mecca is divided into uh, three phases according to, uh, I mean, people who work on the Quranic text. Uh, we will see together the verses in those, in those phases. The second phase is, to, is commonly known as uh, the Medinan phase from uh, 622 till 632. Um, my work on the uh, verses concerning the other and concerning uh, the, the people of the book mainly, Christians and Jews, shows that we can talk about actually three main phases of the Quran, the Meccan, the Medinan, and a third phase of uh, opening. So I'll just let you, uh, I mean, go through the text. I will lead you through the text, uh, each phase with an example. The first phase of Mecca, uh, the, the, uh, the, the community uh, of, the first, uh, uh, of the first Muslims had very little connection with either Christians or Jews. There must have been some connections in Mecca, but very little, not with communities. Yet, they feel as if they, they have this sort of identification. Here, this, uh, this, uh, the verses I'm choosing here are talking about Christians who were persecuted in Arabia and who were put on fire. And uh, the, the identification is very clear between the, the, Muslim, the first Muslims with, so with, uh, with uh, those Christians who were killed. So uh, it's, it's a curse on those who, who made the, 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 the fire. 
and uh, who watched as they witnessed uh, that they were doing against the believers, the Christians here. Okay? And uh, they ill-treated them for no other re reason than that they believed in God. So it's sort of an identification of the first Muslims who were being persecuted and who feel that they are treated exactly the same way as those other believers, the Christians, who had been persecuted. Mecca's second phase, we have the feeling that the first community of Muslims feels that it is one community with the other believers from other faiths. So this and this, this, this verse is saying this community of yours, it was talk, in the context where it's talking about, where the Quran is talking about the other communities, this community of yours is one single community, since I am the sustainer of you all. So a, a, a feeling of belonging to one community. Okay. Uh, and then the third phase also in Mecca, we find a verse like this one, that they do not argue with the followers of earlier, earlier revelation, otherwise that, than in a most kindly manner, and say we believe in that which has been bestowed from uh, on high upon us, as well as that which has been bestowed upon you. For our God and your God is one and the same, and it is unto him that we shall surrender ourselves. So all the Meccan phase, we have this feeling of being one community of believers. Now, in 622, the first Muslims will uh, go uh, into, uh, into Medina. Uh, this is the Hijra. This is where the, when the calendar actually starts. And here they will have relations in Medina, especially with the Jewish communities of Medina. And at the beginning, there was, there was this charter of Medina that was uh, the document of Medina that says, I mean, drafted by the Prophet Muhammad, and that says, you and us, we are one community, about Jews and uh, Muslims. Christians were not uh, present in, uh, in Medina. Uh, a, a, a group visited Medina, but generally it is relations between uh, Muslims and Jews. Yet, bit by bit, the relations will start uh, uh, turning uh, sour, sort of, and the, the dream of being in one, commu in one community appears to be uh, not something that could be, that not realistic, basically. So we will have this competition between the, uh, the two communities, mainly uh, uh, Jewish and uh, uh, Muslim uh, community in Medina. Uh, but in a context, it's always talked in a context of Christians and Jews together, or the people of the book together. So, uh, here we can see that, this, that there is this competition. That, and they claim no one shall enter paradise unless he be a Jew or a Christian. Okay, so this is, we see that there is this sort of uh, not only competition, but the idea that, that prevailed and sometimes still prevails that each community says, well, I own the truth and only my... Uh, the followers of this own religion will, uh, this religion will go to heaven or will have salvation. And if I am true, it means that all the others are false. So uh, based on this equation, of course, uh, these are, this, is, this is an example, but it is something that has continued, I mean, through history. Uh, a second phase in Medina is the, uh, is the phase where uh, we feel that we're moving from trying to, uh, still trying to dialogue, but mainly accepting that there is a demarcation line, that there will, no be, there will not be one community. So here the first verse, yet if you should bring uh, to those uh, who have been given the scripture every sign, they will not follow your direction. Your direction meaning the Qibla, your direction meaning the the way, I mean, you practice uh, your faith, and you are not a followers of their direction. So here we find this separation, with at the same time and the same period still a call for dialogue. Come to a word agreed upon uh, between us and you. The third phase, 
will be, I'm just saying in a nutshell, what uh, will the development of this, this diversion the, uh, or demarcation will be combats. There were actual combats. And it's at, in this phase that we have the verses, one of the verse that I quoted before about fighting. Okay? So, this is it. so, yet, when we see, when we study all the verses that are talking about the other and mainly the people of the book, we find that there is a third phase other than the Meccan and the Medinan. So, this is my thesis, this is my theory. Uh, with this phase, we see that there is, we're, we're moving from first. Uh, wanting in the Medina time, wanting to be one with the old community, then uh, seeing that there is no way, and then divergence, and then conflict, and third, accepting diversity, and seeing a certain unity in diversity. So here it becomes, uh, first, talking about diversity again. For every community, we have appointed a right that they may mention God's name over and uh, so accepting that, again, that there is this diversity and that it has been, it is willed by God. Two, reconciliation. Here, it's very interesting, we have the example of Abraham, Abraham and his people, because Abraham broke away from his people, but oh, tried to uh, uh, um, pray for his father, and uh, according to the Quranic text. So um, the, the, the story of Abraham is mentioned again here with a verse that I put in bold here. It may be that God will bring about between you and those of them with whom you are at enmity, affection. So affection after enmity. And this is for all. I mean for uh, the people of the book, but also for the Meccans who were fighting the, uh, uh, with the Muslims. And also in the third Quranic period, we find this, uh, this verse that is quoted in all uh, occasions of uh, Muslim-Christian dialogue or uh, dialogue where there are uh, uh, Muslims that uh, I mentioned before that God has created uh, people to know each other, to meet, and, uh, and the noblest is the most fearing or the most pious. So uh, and so we see that we are moving from uh, combat to accepting diversity to reconciliation, pardon and reconciliation, and openness, openness to uh, to others uh, and to all communities. And again, in the final uh, surah Al Maida, uh, this finding the unity in diversity first by seeing that we have the same uh, finality the same goal, because we will all be going to God. So again, repeating here, uh, we have appointed a divine, to each of you we have appointed a divine law and a way. If God had willed, he would have made you one community, but that he may try you in what has, uh, he has given you. So vie with one another in good deeds, compete in good deeds. And to God, you shall all return, and he will then inform you of that in which you differed. So, uh, so the call is to see that there is a unity with God afterwards. So here, instead of spending time in, in polemics, uh, compete in good deeds. And, uh, and finally, this unity and diversity in the simplest ways in society, which is eating together and uh, marriage. Now, there is question about marriage that I will leave for the discussion, but today the good things are permitted to you and the food of those who were given the scriptures is permitted to you and permitted to, that, to them is your food. Likewise, uh, uh, believing married women. The verse here is giving the example that men from uh, Islam can marry women from uh, the other uh, religions of the book. So. As a, as, a, as a synthesis, the Quran's pedagogical example is in three phases. One, this, this dream of becoming one community that turned out to be unrealistic. Two, divergence and conflict. So as I said, 
uh, seeing that if one religion is true, the other is false, and then there is no possibility of coexistence, which leads to combat. And three, discovering unity and diversity. Uh, different communities with common points and diverging points united in their destiny to return to God and in the strife of together working for the good of all. I would like to conclude with two uh, examples from, uh, from real life, actually. One is from a 10-year-old student in a class I was giving on world religions, and she turns to me and says, Naila, can we say something positive about another religion? and without it being harmful to our religion? And actually, it is a question that many people ask. And uh, so, and of course, I mean, we can say something good about other religion without it, it, me, it meaning that we are unfaithful to our religion, especially in uh, those religions that have so many common uh, uh, grounds and common points. And uh, to another example from a, a workshop that we did at Adyan, the foundation that uh, Mahdi talked about, with religious leaders in different regions in Lebanon, coexisting next to each other, but never meeting each other. So we had a training for those religious leaders to uh, help them um, uh, create programs of development in their regions. Their, I mean, the different regions in Lebanon where the, the uh, help of the government is not equal. So uh, they don't receive uh, a lot of funding from the government, so they need to do something themselves for their community development. Uh, and so we got them together to see if they could together develop programs and implement them in their region. And the first thing we did with this workshop is we asked them to find in their scriptures if there was anything not allowing them to work together for the good of I mean, all the society that they were in. And they couldn't, of course, and they managed to do great projects in all the regions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tabata. And before we begin um, questions and uh, conversation, um, I'd just like to say a word of like exhortation um, before the question period. and. Um, um, in particular, to mention that the reason why, as part of this sort of nerdy academic project, we have the Quran seminar, that we have these sort of public lectures, is because we don't want um, the only thing that comes out of this um, project to be sort of nerdy intellectuals sitting in a room um, and only speaking in this technical language that is only comprehensible um, to um, the, the small group that's there. But we'd like to speak about the very important topics of Islam and Muslim Christian relations in a way that invites other people into the conversation and also touches people in their faith life. So, um, otherwise put, please um, don't be shy to ask a question. And in particular, with Dr. Tabata, this is a unique opportunity since um, she's someone who's um, an elite uh, intellectual who did her PhD at the Sorbonne uh, in Paris, um, which is almost as good as Notre Dame. <laughs> <laughs> But at the same time, has dedicated her life to um, working to build bridges in Lebanon, which, as you know, is a country that's been torn apart by sectarian strife. So she really cares about connecting with people. So please ask questions and uh, add your own thoughts. And if you don't, I'll just keep on speaking. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I don't know very much about uh, the Quran myself. Uh, growing up in an evangelical sort of fundamentalist home, the, it was common to, to see books on the shelf about the Quran that seemed to take the first approach to reading the Quran as kind of medieval traditionalist interpretation, except that for Christian evangelical scholars reading the Quran with that kind of perspective, so they take the rigorous approach and they want to point out all of these passages that seem to exclude this community university. And so I'm interested in um, this approach, this, this, this way of reading that you have, and I, I'm wondering how one tracks the different phases in the Quran. How does one know when one passage was written? Um, and then how do you sort of put it into that, into that box and then help people understand that the Quran is this sort of layered uh, way of revealing things? Okay. Um, thank you for this question. I would just also like to point out that, as you said, that there were those sort of books 
I mean, also in uh, in Islam, there are many books that are also in this in this uh, in this uh, vein, uh, trying to point out the uh, uh, I mean wrong things or uh, uh, I mean things that n they don't agree with in the Bible and uh, and still today. I mean, this is. Uh, Second, your, your question is that there has been scholarship, whether uh, Islamic scholarship or uh, uh, Orientalist scholarship, but today, I mean, I don't think we divide anymore like this. Today is, I mean, there are uh, Quranic studies uh, that, uh, that study the text, first on the level of the language itself, because you can see in the text the development of the language and the length of the verses and the themes. And this allows to, uh, to divide and to see uh, which, uh, uh, which verse or which uh, chapter of the Quran comes before the other. Now, there is no uh, uh, one uh, uh, chronological order that everybody agrees upon. There are always also uh, differences between one scholar and the other, but there are main schools that have uh, uh, their own chronological uh, orders. Classify the um, Islamic argument to three levels of like making chapters or surahs and Adina and the last one, which I didn't get if it's the historical period that you're trying to say, because Medina would be the end of it. So yes, exactly. Is it that you divide Medina period to first like being uh, confrontational and then becoming more realistic in a sense that there's a space for shared belief and shared like commitment yes. of religions? Mm -hmm. And the surahs that you mentioned, are they like historically the later Medina surahs that bring up the idea of like compromise and recognition <coughs> and uh, appreciation of other religions or like, yes, yes, it is chronological now, of course, but there are differences between uh, some uh, some chronologies. For example, the the uh, sword. Uh, remember the verse on the sword. Uh, that for some is put towards the end, uh, and others just put it push it a bit back. Uh, I am with the ones who push it a bit a bit back because of the end. Uh, we can see a certain unity in the in the end, uh, uh, the last surahs, and uh, historically speaking, also we have the Medina phase. But at the end of the Medina phase, we have the reconquest of Mecca, the return to Mecca. So also historically, there it's not just one block, one Medina. There is something in the end. There is something different, which is the return to Mecca. Um, say that we obviously have to go back to the Quran to uh, for these sources, but um, but then as you as you develop, there are inevitably contradictions, and and one runs into the problems of interpretation and canon and the like. Um, are, are there strategies uh, that that you can, uh, available in the Islamic tradition for doing kind of an end run around scripture uh, in favor of kind of natural law arguments for uh, pluralism um, and? Um, uh, I mean, obviously, they couldn't, be, they couldn't ignore the canonical text, but as, as an alternative source of authority, um, that, that might um, kind of avoid some of the problems of interpretation of scripture. I need somebody um, to translate the question. Yeah. <laughs> so, what are the strategies that would allow um, a Muslim scholar to acknowledge more, perhaps, rigorous passages, passages in the Quran, but saying we have other sources for our, our religious thought? whether that be hadith or maybe more philosophical reasoning yeah, that would have to be put in balance with the Quran. Yeah, yeah like with the Talmud and, and the medieval period, you know, the figures that are thinking in terms of natural law and, uh, uh, as a way of grounding um, yeah. a theory of tolerance uh, yeah. or... Yeah there, yeah, there is, if you like, some um, what, seeds for this natural law, but it's not yet, uh, not yet developed. I would argue, though, that the best way is to uh, let the Quran speak and take it holistically. I mean, take a theme and see it in the whole Quran instead of going uh, to the other sources. I mean, like the Hadith, and uh, because uh, um, as we know, I mean, the Quran has been uh, 
written uh, down during, I mean, the time of the Prophet or just after it. Where, whereas hadith, we have to wait uh, uh, at least a century and a half to have it uh, written down. And likewise for the seerah, the biography. So uh, the most, uh, uh, I mean, secure source would be the Quran itself. And to go back to it, and uh, I mean, this, this, what I showed, I mean, or uh, is more a way of uh, working with the, with the Quranic text without going to hadith or without the need of uh, to other sources, but I mean, resolving things according to uh, uh, contextualization. Claire. It's contextualization. <laughs> I mean, the easiest uh, thing is that in the theological approach, you do not have changes. All the phases, they have the same message. I mean, there is the verses concerning salvation, and there are the verses concerning uh, divergence or uh, differences in dogma. Both are the same. It's not like Mecca, Medina, any phase of either, you have the same. And they are repeated at the end in Al-Ma'idah, all of them clearly together. So this is why in the theological approach, the Quran itself does not uh, change attitude or, uh, but the, the, uh, the practical, the Quran is showing what is happening on the ground, what was happening in its face. So this is, this is why I'm talking about contextualization. So at points it is showing uh, 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 moments of, uh, of openness and of friendship and others it is showing moments of combat. But uh, I would go back, because you said that I ended with the idea of compromise. Uh, I, I, this is not the, I, I don't really like the idea of compromise. It is more the verses that I was mentioning is not compromising or not even uh, uh, tolerance. It is seeing that we are united in the fact that we have a common destiny, to him we shall return. He will this diversity. We do not understand it here. He will explain it in the other world. And here we are asked to work together for, uh, for the good and not compromise. I'd actually like to insert a question. Is that OK? And then I'll, sure, yeah. Is that, yeah, yeah. So um, and it's a theological question that Claire alluded to. Um, and it, it actually though comes from a conversation um, with a student who's in this room. But I won't put going out we'll him this or her. Um, <laughs> which is the question of the word Allah, mm -hmm. and um, I, I suppose um, who this Allah is. So Allah is the Arabic word for God, but it's also the name given by God in the Islamic revelation. 
And um, of course, one of the sort of practical connections to the question is that um, in, um, in the country of Malaysia, there was a law that um, the Arabic word Allah, of course, it's a Malay speaking country, but the Arabic word Allah um, could, could not be used by non Muslims, that they had to use the Malay word. I, I don't know the details, but I think it was, went back and forth in the court system. And I've also noticed, maybe you've noticed too, that some Arabic speaking Christians, particularly evangelicals, but maybe others too, don't like to use the word Allah for God. Mm -hmm. So instead of saying, um, you know, may Allah bless you, they'll say, may the Lord bless you, mm -hmm. Allah be better, mm -hmm. something like that. I wonder if, if you've noticed that too, speaking to people, if that's, there's um, among religious leaders, Muslims or Christians, whether there's a sense that Allah means this God of Islam, whether Christians mm -hmm. and Muslims have that sense. Um, and also, um, generally, if um, you think that the, rev the revelation of the Qur'an gives really specific characteristics to this God, and so by saying Allah, we mean a particular kind of God. Mm. Okay. Uh, I, I, I would just also like to remember that the Qur'an itself is saying that this is the same God. You, we're, we're worshipping the same God. Uh, in in uh, in Lebanon, in my experience in Lebanon, I have not encountered any uh, any person directly or saying that Allah is only for Muslims and uh, Muslims only have the right to use it, or that uh, Christians saying that we don't want to use it to uh, to be different. Uh, I have not encountered this. Um, the word is in Arabic, and so is Ar Rahman Ar Rahim, the, the merciful, the compassionate, also was among the uh, Arab Christians uh, uh, used uh, used before. The um, uh, the uh, attributes of God could be uh, different, but the main attributes are uh, are the same. He's 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 at the same time. Uh, uh, all loving or all merciful and all powerful and those are the main things and he is with us from creation into this world and in the end of the world so these are the main attributes that are common uh, uh, so there would be for example uh, differences for example in Islam there is no uh, father God is not referred to as the father that's one of the main uh, differences. But I would say that when we say uh, uh, my Allah is different than your God, it's as if I'm saying there are two gods, actually. So if we're believers in one God, I mean, we cannot go into this. We just can say that uh, there are differences in, uh, in, in, in perception of or in the attributes of God, but at the same time, so many uh, common points in, uh, in the attributes of God from uh, both traditions or from three traditions. Okay. Um, <coughs> so, so first, I'll, I'll say something about the, the, the natural law point. I mean, I'm wondering, uh, the, the Quran, I mean, there is some sort of scriptural uh, grounds for that, right? I mean, fitra, uh -huh. uh, human nature, and people have used uh, the Quran to sort of try to derive a conception of I mean, natural law is too strong of a word over there, but especially when, when engaging with non-people of the book communities. And I mean, in places like India, obviously, that was the big question. Are these people of the book or not? So some, some folks said, okay, it doesn't matter. I mean, because there's something else that unites us. It's, it's human nature, it's which already submits. Mm -hmm. so, I, mean, I, I mean, so one question would be, what would you make of that? Mm -hmm. And the second question would be, um, what do you make of... Um, proselytization or attempts or theological conversations uh, in which a Muslim might actually try to convince a non-Muslim that, you know, as you said, it's, the, according to Islam, Islam is the best religion. So to me, it seems like it follows from that position that, okay, you should convert. Uh, and what do you say about that? Okay, I'll start with the second one. And then you remind me of the first one, <laughs> jet lag. Uh, the Quran itself, when it's talking about da'wah, about proselytization, is saying, uh, call to God. Uh, doesn't say call to Islam. It's always call to God in, in, uh, in good deeds and in good... Uh, so based on the Quran itself, I am not with the position of uh, trying to, uh, to convert people... Uh, uh, 
through that because the, the Quran is saying call to God. So basically call, uh, maybe call each one and their own faith to be more faithful to their, uh, to their, to their faith or system. Yet keeping uh, in, uh, open, I mean, the freedom of choice of anyone to, to do what they want. And uh, the, the, uh, the first question, really, I need reminding. Some opinion on the, the Quranic or Islamic notion of fitrah. It's fitrah, thank you. Thank you. There is a verse in, uh, in uh, Surah Al A'raf, which is Surah uh, 7, the verse uh, 172, that is talking about if you want creation before creation. Uh, it's a bit ambiguous, the verse, but it gives an example, it gives uh, an image that God takes all the descendants of Adam as they were uh, not really existentiated, not really on earth, but created. So this is a pre-creation, as, uh, as if they call it alam al the, the world of atoms. So God takes them all, all the people who will become, who will be, and asks them, am I not your Lord? And they said, yes. So many based fitra on this. Humans are created with this believing in something, believing in God, believing in the creator that is, is higher, I mean, uh, higher than them, and uh, uh, are, are called, I mean, to, uh, to act according to this fitra or to find it again. And that actually God uh, helps humans reach this fitra or this, this first stage either through revelation, through the religions, or through personal uh, revelation, or through, through personal uh, inspiration or reminding, through, the, through life, through uh, problems, obstacles, good things, where a human is, goes back within to, to remember who is the sustainer, who is the giver, who is the creator. So this is, of course, a very good ground to say that uh, um, not to stay in the level of the people of the book as other religions, but all humanity. And there are so many other verses that t talk about the dignity of, uh, given by God to all humans, and that also God put uh, uh, he breathed his spirit into Adam, and we are all from Adam. So all of these uh, different elements may uh, be the grounds for seeing, I mean, uh, uh, for opening, if you want, the, the, uh, uh, all this argument, uh, argumentation to others. Also, there are uh, verses in the Quran that talk about many prophets. And a verse says that many of the prophets that we have told you about meaning that God told Muhammad about or mentioned them by name in the Quran, and many of those I haven't told you about. So this also opened for many theologians the uh, way to, to consider other religions as uh, being uh, founded by a prophet sent by God, even though it is not apparent. Uh, and as you said, I mean, in India, for example, gave a, a, a good uh, example of uh, uh, trying to fit other religions on within the people of the book, because I mean, they are considered, I mean, best religions after Islam, uh, going back to the legitimacy of each religion to see itself as the best, and. Uh, considering the others as being part of uh, the people of the book. So. Okay. Uh, and we know that in Islam, and in the Quran, repeatedly it says that uh, Jesus is a very high rank prophet of God, and we Muslim believe in earlier revelations. What about on the other Abrahamic religions? Do they also consider Prophet Muhammad and Quran as a valid and valid messenger of God and a valid text from uh, the Word of God. Okay. So what about the plurality on the other Abrahamic religions? Okay, I will give you the easy answer first and then the, the uh, more developed answer. The easy answer first is that it's very easy for Muslims to recognize previous religions because it comes after them in time 
and uh, Christianity and Judaism are mentioned in the Quran. Jesus, Moses, Abraham, all the prophets are mentioned in the Quran. So it is not, I mean, a very big effort that Muslims do to recognize other religions. They're already mentioned. The other way around is more difficult. What would you do with a religion that comes after you and that is not mentioned? I would give the example for Muslims on the Baha'i faith. The Baha'i faith is being a, a, a faith that is connected to the same uh, uh, line, and, uh, but it is not uh, mentioned by the Quran. So this is more difficult. This is the, uh, the challenge that has been dealt with by uh, Judaism and uh, uh, by Christianity. I know more about uh, Christian theology. Um, the 20th century has seen many theologians who have tried to uh, see the possibility of uh, recognizing uh, Muhammad as a uh, prophet in the biblical sense and of the Quran as an inspired book. But my, my own uh, perception is that actually these are, uh, as I was telling you, the differences or the divergences, the differences between uh, Islam and Christianity are so little in the end when you are putting all the, all the, 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 the common points. I, I mean, so believing in God, believing in revelation, believing in prophets, believing in angels, and uh, believing in God with us in history, and my, so many points that are in common. The points that are different is that Christians believe in uh, incarnation and trinity that Muslims don't believe in, and Muslims have uh, Muhammad and the Quran that Christians don't believe in. Why to ask the other to believe in uh, in something that, that is, I mean, uh, making you uh, uh, different or, or uh, giving each one its own uh, identity. I mean, the discourse in all uh, encounters of dialogue from Muslims is to the others, recognize us. Recognize us. But th there is no need for a recognition of Muhammad as a prophet or the Quran as a revealed book from the other. There is no need. There is a need for recognition of me as a Muslim living in this society and to get that I have my own set of beliefs, we have things in common that we believe in, and then we can work together. Thank you. Friends, uh, before we thank again Dr. Tabara, I have two um, important notes, although those seem less important compared to this concluding um, reflection. <laughs> Um, but one is we do have um, a reception in which we can continue all of these sorts of important discussions. And it's right out here in the, the Great Hall, which is you know, just um, beyond this space. So please join us for that. And please come back tomorrow at 5 p.m., not here, but in McKenna Hall, room 100, where we'll hear a talk on the Quran and mysticism by Dr. Maria Musharraf, who's just arrived in South Bend today from Iran. Um, but for tonight, let's once again thank uh, Dr. Dubai. Thank you.